Okay, um, I'm going to start by reading two verses of something you'd be very familiar with and which um, relates to the book, although the book makes it quite clear that it isn't a trade union history or a history of, of organization of Dockers politically. But I think this is worth starting the evening with. It's by Liam McGowan. The citizen army is out today and if you wonder why, go ask the lords of the banking house if their cash returns be high. Tisn't the bosses who bear the brunt, tisn't you and I, but those women and kids whose tears were hid as the strikers went stumbling by. The docker loads 200 tons in his master's ships per day. At night, the docker's daughter bends her weary limbs to pray. From the old north wall to Liberty Hall was a deadline of unskilled. They heaved and hauled when the bosses called and stopped when the bosses willed. The citizen army is out today and if you wonder why, it's because Jim Larkin came this way to nail the bosses lie. The iron jives and their limbs and lives would crush them till they die. Those women and kids whose tears were hid as the strikers went marching by. The docker and carter and heaver of coal were only the backwash then, till Larkin built that union up and the bosses feared again. From the old north wall to Liberty Hall came that deadline of unskilled in a newborn fight for the workers' rights that the bosses thought they'd killed. Now the relevance of that is because the 1913 lockout, the creation of the Irish Transport and General Workers' Union, and much of the crucible uh, elements of the formation of our state <coughs> were born on these keys. They were born out of the Dockers' Union, and we can trace Dockers' Unions back to at least 1875, when 1,500 Dockers marched under various names, key labourers and so on, and the O'Connell Parade. And Dockers' Unions had existed among coal porters, grain porters, weighers, and various other groups, usually in a fairly short-term basis. Now, we don't know exactly why it was short-term, it may have been maladministration, difficult organization, but it was more to do with the casual and uncertain nature of the dockers' trade. Employed on a daily, indeed hourly basis as spellsmen, and therefore very difficult to root organization. Until, of course, in 1909, when the Irish Transport and General Workers' Union came along. But as I say, this is not a book that specifically looks at that, although that would be my interest. It is a book of a much more neglected area because we know about the 1913 lockout from Porter Yates's book and we know some things about Docker's organization politically. But we don't know much about occupational culture, a phrase lifted from the, the theoretical methodological introduction of the book. And it's not just that Dockers have gone, as you will know yourselves, your communities, your language, your lifestyle, your songs, your social behavior has gone with it. You're the coal miners, if you like, the steel workers. And we have other areas of activity in Ireland where hopefully this book, an academic press can publish it, will serve as beacon to encourage other scholars and communities to engage in looking at their own background. A, a good example might be, for example, Semperit and Ballyfermot. Uh, that's a project that would uh, certainly merit a similar uh, organization. And a job that had a similar impact on people in Ballyfermot including teaching them a sense of time, which we were talking about earlier, i.e. getting into work and stuff. The oral history sources have been blended beautifully with the printed sources, and this book is beautiful in a number of ways. It's a terrific book to give to your grandkids to show them what the granddad or the great-granddad did. It's visible, it's alive, it's emotive. At the same time, if you're somebody who's interested in a scholarship, the footnotes, the sources are all there. So it allows people to follow various other uh, elements that they like. So it's scholarly, accessible, fascinating, and a credit to Don and to Aileen and all those involved in the project. One thing that always amuses me, and it came across very forcibly in 2013 when we did a variety of events on the lockout, was how few people today, modern Dubliners, have any consciousness that they actually are operating in a port. And the last little comment that Eileen made about casual workers and uh, zero hours contracts really becomes very relevant. Through the International Transport Workers Federation, you're familiar with the campaigns for international standards for mariners on flags of convenience. 
Well, in more recent years, SIPTA has re-established the Port National Port Committee, and we're now trying to look at the concept of ports of convenience. Maybe not the building to be signed in it altogether, but <laughs> nevertheless to try to protect uh, the, 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 the occupations and in, in, influence of those people. Now, the buttons, I'm wearing one tonight in honor of Paddy Losty. Uh, it was from South Lots, he was a cross-channel docker for Rings End. He gave me this 40 years ago, and he's a lovely man, long dead, but I'm thinking of Paddy tonight. Uh, those buttons are part of the culture. There's a wee tray of them on the, on the desk there, and in a way they epitomize a lot of what the docks were about, father to son, a name, a rank, uh, but also the beginning of the end as casualization goes to registration, goes to where we have today. Uh, some of the dockers wore them on their belts, and one of the items in the Labour History Museum is Miley Kinsella's uh, cross-channel docker's belt when he has the badge of the National Union of Dock Labourers, pre-1909, Transport Union, 1909, Workers' Union, 1924, and Marine, uh, sorry, Irish Seamen and Port Workers, 35, and Workers' Union, uh, probably in the 60s. And these were studied on his belt. But for Valerie uh, McCarty, Don's widow, who's here tonight, we should tell a Cork story. It's that my favourite Dockers badge in the whole of Ireland is from Cork. Sorry to say that uh, to, to Dublin Dockers. It's a huge thing. It's about that size, and it's brass, and it just says Cork Carrier, I-T-G-W, with a number. And I'm looking at that and thinking, how the hell do you put that on, you know, on your lapel? And the guy that gave it to me said, oh, it wasn't worn by the men, it was worn by the horse. <laughs> So, so this was stuck on the bridle of the horse because you weren't recognized as a docker unionized through the dock gate. Adam, but if the cat and the horse were in the union, that was grand. So, but there is one badge I just want to draw your attention to because apart from anything else, what dockers have done through Des Brannigan, the late Des Brannigan, is to produce what, in my view, is undoubtedly the most beautiful, elegant badge produced by the Irish Trade Union Movement, the badge of the Marine Port and General Workers Union. Midnight blue for maritime and, and nighttime, the starry plough as an indication for safe navigation uh, and seamanship of members, but also the flag of Irish socialism, the knot of St. Brendan the Navigator to indicate the long maritime tradition the island people have, and the interlocking nature of the, inter of the solidarity of members, both as crew members and as trade units. A thing of beauty, and I'm glad that's in the book. The nicknames and the language of work, again, is something which will go because, it, you know, nowadays, work is increasingly individualized. People work at screens. Uh, they're, they're in a virtual world, as it were. It's not going to give rise to those names like bearer off and double topper, singer out, and so on. And by the way, those names appear to change, to some extent, port by port. Uh, I was also intrigued, I always thought hobblers, until I read this, uh, were only involved in piloting. And there are two monuments to the hobblers, one on Dunleary Pier, if you've never seen it, and one just by the bridge here. Two little monuments you can have a look at. What this book tells me is that they originally, uh, when Dublin Port was hard to access, uh, became lighter men. That is to say, they took cargoes off into smaller vessels. And one of the highest mortality rates anywhere in, in, in the maritime world was for those people, particularly when they lighted at sea as opposed to on a river or, 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 or whatever. And the word apparently comes from hobbler, or the hobbler to seek safe asylum. So the hobblers are in, in, the, in the thing as well. The hiring and firing um, systems. I actually thought that I should have started off tonight by calling out a few names and to see who disappeared out the door <laughs> ready for the ship. And my favourite one is because of the nicknames when the guy calling the, calling the reed shouted out, Mouse! three men walked, because there was Mouse Senior, Mouse Junior, and Mouse in the middle, and he shouts out, I said Mouse, not Mice. <laughs> so I thought that was uh, very, uh, you know, very good. I was involved as an official in the ITGW, and um, just two quick stories from that. One is I remember Des Geraghty, when he was a young uh, a branch assistant to Walter McFarlane. Some of you will remember Walter McFarlane, Dublin number one branch, when he had a dispute when the dockers wouldn't unload a ship which contained toilet accessories. And eventually they got an extra bonus which appeared on the wage slip as embarrassment money, which I thought was <laughs> fairly good. In 1966, for the first time since 1911, there was a global international maritime strike of British seamen. And this was still in 66, the time when the British Merchant Marine basically were around the globe. The National Union of Seamen, for example, had full-time offices in places like Cape Town and 
Sydney and uh, Montreal and places like that. They never closed Liverpool port. And the argument was that if they'd attempted to close Liverpool port, they would have required a picket line umpteen miles long. In 1967, the year after the strike, which was effectively defeated, the National Union of Seamen, a British-based union, held its annual conference in Liberty Hall. Why? A tribute to the fact that Dublin Port closed. What closed it? A single placard stuck at Alexander Gate. Just one <laughs> placard closed the port to British shipping and as a tribute to the Dublin Dockers. Now that tells you something about the solidarity, sense of identity, and international sense among other Dockers. And maybe one of the few things that is maybe missing slightly from the book is the international element which people were conscious of. And I'm going to finish with a little couple of verses of a poem which uh, demonstrates that point. The other most interesting story uh, is about the ghost men. Do you know what the ghost men were? They were on the cattle boats, and the cattle boats finished, I think in the, yeah, it would have been in the, in the mid-50s. The cattle boats, uh, uh, sorry, the, the crewing of cattle boats actually finished. Men came off the boats. But the union, which was then the Irish Seamen and Port Workers Union, insisted that they still be paid. So crew members were paid. They were paid off in the Liverpool bar, as legend has it. They never actually sailed. They became ghostmen, and they're referred to in the book. I happened to read through the, um, the cabinet, Irish cabinet minutes for the row, one of the disputes when the Siemens Union was first created in 1956, 57, 58. And there's a whole section of stuff from the Irish cattle exporters pointing out X percent of the costs were for men who never actually sailed. So that's maybe one of the more disreputable elements of, of the Dockers' life, the, the, uh, the, the, what do you call it, the ghost men. Um, the other thing about the, the Dockers is the tremendous culture that they generated, much of which is probably lost. We're going to hear a song to finish off, and there are other snippets and so on in the book. But I'm sure there is a lot more stuff that Declan and the Dock Workers Preservation Society are going to, are going to gather. So I'm going to just finish with two quick stories. Uh, the first one, I was about 17. As you can hear from the accent, I grew up across the other side of the, of the Irish Channel. And I arrived in Dublin on the, whatever the overnight ferry was, and I was looking for a cup of tea. And in those days, the only place that was ever open before about nine was Cherise. Do you remember Cherise on yeah. Middle Abbey Street? And even that wasn't open, so I was a bit desperate. And the guy says to me, oh, you, you'll, you'll get a cup of tea and I can't remember, did he say the Earl Mooney or the Talbot Mooney, but it was one of the Mooney's bars, either in Earl Street or, or Talbot Street. So I walked in, and when I walked in, I was 17, I had the compulsory student uniform of long hair, combat jacket and jeans, and I walked up to the bar, and as I got to the bar, it was crowded with men, pints all over the place, and I instinctively knew that I was probably in the wrong place. <laughs> so I had a sort of slight sense of fear. On the other hand, I was hungry and thirsty. So I got to the bar and I said, uh, I had a chance of a cup of tea and a sandwich. To which the barman rather gruffly said, this isn't effing Bewley's, you know. So, <laughs> whereupon a guy stood at the bar next to me, nudges me and said, are you a effing student? Now I turned, I looked at the door and thought I'm young and fit and I'll probably get there before he does. So I denied that I was a student, at which point he says, ah, Paddy, give this, what do you want? How much is some? So suddenly I knew I was okay. He says, you are a student, aren't you? And I said, well, well, if you're a student, he says, you can settle the row. And he turns me, and there's about 15 guys sitting at a table that's pretty laden, and they're dockers. And they were on full back pay, they'd gone in, they'd registered, signed in, they were now having a couple of points before they went home. Do you know what they were arguing about? The argument was how many languages, and Theo Dorgan is with us tonight, will enjoy this, how many languages did the poet James Clarence Mangan write in? <laughs> now they'd agreed Irish and English, probably Latin, likely French, and what's the famous poem, John Bull, Jenkinson, uh, the Mangan thing, was it Arabic and Persian, or Persian and Arabic, or neither of the above? I had never heard of James Clarence Mangan. <laughs> But the dockers had. And my early days in the Transport Union, you'd find a lot of fellas would have tremendous interest, particularly in Irish literature, and were often able to quote from O'Casey and you know, all the plays. So there was a cultural dimension to these people. And some people, I remember John Hume once classically saying, what happened to all the characters in Derry? And he said, free third level education. 
And a lot of the Dockers, for all they were Dockers, were highly intelligent, extremely well read, and culturally very significant in, in their own communities. The last thing I'm going to do is just read from a poem to emphasize this point. When the Transport Union was formed in 1909, uh, it was a Dockers Union. It had branches in Belfast, Dundalk, Dublin, Wexford, Waterford, Cork, and the outpost in Sligo, where incidentally after the 1913 Sligo dock strike, the union became the stevedore and remained the stevedore. Not that I'm making any suggestions here this evening, of course. Uh, but it remained a dockers union until after the rising when the union expanded in 1917, became a national union. So they published a lot of material that we know was written by dockers, poems, snippets, short stories, etc. This is a poem actually by an Australian, republished from an Australian dockers union called The Winch or the Dockers Orchestra. I'm just going to read this to finish it off to indicate how the culture of the language, the <coughs> occupational culture that this book so beautifully and elegantly describes is enshrined in this particular poem. What Brady, the guy that wrote it, probably didn't realize in 1911, because it's in praise of the winch or it's about the winch, is that what we were really seeing was the thin end of a wedge that would eventually spread to the state. That we now are where dockers are, you know, are, are an endangered species. It's not the pipe of an organ clear, the engines play to an engineer. It is not the carol of songbirds gay, her cordage songs at the break of day, when a clipper's course is fairly laid about the track of a roaring trade. But first a grunt and a snaky hiss of steam pipes, pipes leaking an oily kiss, a rusty rattle of iron gear or a new hydraulic lifting clear, a grip, a strain or a patent clinch. And that's the song of a working winch. Oh, it's cargo out and it's cargo in, a port to leave and a port to win. So grab your baskets and hook her slings. Hustle the dunnage, you ugly things. Way from the hatches and let her go. Stand from under there, under, below. Rudder and thudder, thurud. Cuss your body, your bones and blood. Stiffen your feelings, flatten your soul. Get to the bushels down in the hole. No use to falter, weaken or flinch. This is the call of the working winch. Up with the hardware, down with the bales, under the gunnel, over the rails. Tally clerk, tally clerk, where have you been? Jamming my thumb in the old machine. Then tie it up with a bit of string and lower away like anything. Now what's the matter below, below? Only a cask on a poor cove's toe. Then cut off his blucher quickly, oh. Hospital bound for a month or so. Send him right up in a canvas sling and heave away there like anything. Heave away for a year and a day. Stick to us dog hooks and heave away for spans, bridges and trunks of boots and casks are taller, slop made suits and crater and coffins to lift and haul. The winch will tackle them one and all. Rattle it out and rattle it in. The wharves are filled with her rowdy din. For no canary or silver eye are lifting their little sweet songs on high. Linnet or nightingale, lark or finch, is this the unmusical coarse ship's winch? She earns her bread and she must be fed. Those fifty stevedores fall down dead. For the ships must come and the ships may go. Set so out of the hatchway down below. Steady them slings. Now heave away slow, stick to your hoist, don't fail nor flinch, and feed the eternal winch, winch, winch. I highly recommend a most beautiful book, elegantly constructed, and it's not just about Don and Aileen. Look at yourselves. This is you, and you've been recorded beautifully. Thanks for everything.